Thank you and welcome to everybody uh, today. Uh, well, first, before we start, I want to say thank you to Mark Hart for hosting last week. I was unfortunately deployed away and I will probably be deployed again in the next fortnight and hopefully I'll be able to get on. But if not, Mark has also graciously uh, offered to host that one and that will be with Eric Tangman talking about utilizing the square view tabs for choreographic management. Today we have the incomparable, incomparable, the wonderful and the delightful Ms. Betsy Gotta. Betsy's going to be talking about having success with the dancers because that's really what it is all about. It's not about being the best caller. It's not about being the best singer. It's not about being the best choreographer. It's about the one that has the dancers that want to keep coming to you because they're successful and they're having fun with you while they're dancing. And Betsy, I cannot say enough, but all I can say is you are in that category that has the term master in front of that. So I've introduced you a number of times. I want to welcome you back. If you want to read about Betsy's accolades, or if you would like me to tell you about Betsy's accolades, we'll probably be here till about 1030, just before I even get halfway through them. Please don't. Enough said. Betsy, welcome back. And the stage is yours. Thank you, Mill. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. And and basically, after I, after Mel introduces me each time, I know I do not. I should not go out and buy any hats because my head will be swollen a little for a while. <laughs> You've earned it, girl. All righty. Well, let's talk about how to help the dancers succeed. Okay. Share. Uh, There we are, helping dancers succeed. Steps to help the dancers move smoothly through your dance. And the first thing I wanna say is that we use one of the most inefficient means of communication that we can possibly use. Uh, we're talking words and words are really inefficient to convey what is in my head to the into the heads of all the dancers on the floor and all and all the all the caller students and everybody else. So we have to figure out other ways to make sure we can help the dancers succeed. And I, let me tell you, I think I do it well, but I fail too. I'll tell you about a spectacular one last night after after a while. So first. If you're calling somewhere, discover the dancer's abilities. If you, when you've called for a, for a group previously, you still have to allow for visitors, new graduates, the full moon or other distractions. Maybe, maybe somebody's really worried about the price of the gas. Maybe somebody, somebody's relatives have, have just yelled at them. They're not gonna be functioning as well as they would normally. If this is a guest tip, where you've never called for the group before. Observe what the club caller uses, what the club caller calls. Start in simple, I say simple cliches. Start with the comfortable cliche sequences. Understand the degree of difficulty in the area. What may be difficult in a club that I call for in New Jersey may be less difficult or quite accepted, say in Europe or in Australia but you have to understand the degree of difficulty where you are. After you call the cliche sequence and, they, and that will help dancers get used to your voice and your accent and your way of delivering things. Maybe you say right and left grand instead of grand right and left. To me, they're the same call, but if the dancers have always heard their callers say, right and left grand, and I'm saying grand right and left, it takes a minute or a second or two to adjust to the delivery style. After you've done the cliche sequences, then use calls that are more unusual. In this area, walk and dodge and cross fold at mainstream are less usual. Uh, cross fire, explode the wave, perhaps, you know, trade the wave without ever saying take a peek because I truly believe some of us have used take a peek to help so often that it's become the name of the call. Try calls from unfamiliar formations or arrangement. If you have a boy, boy, girl, girl, ocean wave, call a swing through or spin the top, see if, they, if that works. 
if they're comfortable with that, get out of it and then add, then add on to it. If you have, uh, if you can put them into a left-handed column, do a single file circulate, see if that works. Left-handed waves, do a scoot back, see what happens. It could be exciting. But that's how you find what the dancer's abilities are. And this should, you know, this won't take the whole tip. It'll only take a few sequences. They have done a couple of presentations. I know Barry Clasper did it twice on, uh, with some others on sussing the floor. How do you find out what the dancers can do in your early tip? Or if you're doing a guest tip, early in your tip. Know or plan how to normalize quickly. Understand what formation and arrangement each call will create. If you start in a boy, boy, girl, girl wave, and you call a swing, and it's a right handed wave, you call a swing through, now you're going to have every boy has a girl. The question is depending on where they were to begin, are the girls facing into the, into the square or are they facing out? If the girls are facing out and you call a boy's run, you will have wonderful normal couples and lines of four facing out. That may not be the way you wanted to have the square arrange or the formation and arrangement you have want the square. So you, I, I look, before I call boy's run to normalize, I look for, are the girls facing in, in if you're in waves? Because I want, I want to have the boys run into lines facing. So I can perhaps call a flutter wheel right after it. I've planned that in advance and that feels normal. So whatever I had them do that was strange, they now are back to a comfort zone. Dancers will fix situations that feel strange to them. We all know this. We've seen it happen probably. When you write choreography, build in resolve points. If you have a long piece of written choreography and you are stuck calling the entire 16 figure call or sequence and two out of your three squares break down, you're in trouble. You're not, you're not feeling good anymore. And the dancers may not either. Get the dancers home so that everybody can start again. And then you can, you can go into the same sort of sequence and go further down into the, into the meat of the, of the sequence that you may have skipped. Build in ways to get the dancers to standard slash normal lines so you can get everyone dancing again. I got away from using normal lines because everybody laughed at me when I told them they were normal. So, so I go back. Give a hint to reassure the dancers. If, if they're not in a, a standard setup, say all the girls are in the center, everybody go forward and back. That way the girls don't get out of the center if they think they're on the wrong side. If the group is familiar with you, review how to make lines if necessary. There are times when the dancers have, there is a standard way to make lines that Caller Lab has published. It's a good thing for us to all teach our dancers that when we're doing classes. And then if we have to remind them how to make lines so that we don't have six in one line and two in the other, which happens periodically. Work, working with recent graduates, use short sequences. Lots of Alaman left and a right and left grands feel, give confidence. Oh, look, we got it, we succeeded. Each time, each time, the dancers get to the Alaman left, especially if they're new, it is a reward. It's their reward. As they get more jaded and more experienced, they may not want that same, same number of, of Alaman left. But if you've got brand new dancers, give them a lot of success with the Alaman left and the right and left grant. Pick a theme call and use it in a standard situation first. One of the reasons that I like to use a theme call is that newer, newer graduates or newer dancers have seen all the calls at some point or another, but every caller has the ones they use the most. And we'll get into that more. Um, so if you pick a theme where the dancers are a little less comfortable, you can 
actually help them to become better dancers and build on a theme to make the dance, you know, interesting. After the sequence, it uses a strange formation or arrangement. Use another standard sequence. I don't know why I have scoop back in there, but that's all right. Set up the variation so that you can use helper words to cue. For example, if only the center, oh, okay, it's the scoop back here. If only the centers are doing the scoop back, make sure the boys are going in to trade and the girls are, are flipping over because at least in this area, that's the most common way to do this. Years ago, I didn't know that for a long time. Years ago, I was learning how to call advanced and the caller assigned the caller I was working with, my mentor assigned me a call to teach. And it was, I believe it was scoot and dodge. And I didn't know that the boys always went in to turn on the scoot back and the girls always dodged over. So I started it from, from parallel waves. And they I had no understanding of why these dancers weren't succeeding. If they were learning, learning advanced, I thought they would be more, more you know, comfortable with all the mainstream and or plus calls. And somebody came and told me, Betsy, we don't know scoot back except from a standard situation. And I, and I had to reply, I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be, um, I don't mean to be mean or whatever, but I don't understand what you mean by a, a standard arrangement or standard situation. I'd never worked with boys only going in and the girls only flipping over. So that's that gets back to what I said on a previous page also about be aware of what's normal and what's used most in the area you're calling. Use singing call figures that are shorter than the 64 beats. You can add a time filler if they finish early. If worse comes to worse, have the centers trade. If you're in a wave and they're going to swing their corner and they're way early, have the centers trade twice. It's have, have everybody pass through and do a U-turn back. Those are, those are dumb little things that will take up time. And that way they, you, they don't stand at home, but you don't rush them because if you have recent graduates and you rush them, they lose sense of where they are in the square, then they lose confidence and then they lose their ability to do the things that they had learned. So we need to be very careful and gentle. Helping words. Try to give the dancers clues by stating what formation they should have. Standard parentheses, normal facing lines, two face lines, girls in the middle. Now your, your ultimate your ultimate hint is we have two face lines. The girls are in the middle and they're holding right hands with each other. They have a boy on their other side. That's really, that's really as blatant as I can, I can be for my, for my uh, clue as to where they should be. Remember, not all the dancers are familiar with all the formation names. The dan a lot, most dancers know, know ocean waves. Most dancers know, um, most dancers know uh, two-faced lines. I'm not sure if dancers would understand that two sets of facing couples in a column would be an eight chain through position. I would just say facing couples to try and get them there. Uh, so don't use terms that the dancers might not be familiar with. Uh, add some humor. I was hoping all the girls would be in the middle. Mostly the boys are in the center. And if, if you are comfortable doing this, what I do, because I, I have lots of experience, what I do, if I have three girls and one boy in the middle, and I wanna give a hint by saying, I was hoping all the girls would be in the center, I will move the boy in the middle right near the girl on the, or the I move the boy in the middle right near the girl who's on the outside. So when I say, I was really hoping all the girls would be in the middle, they can quickly switch. If, they, if they're not panicked. If they are panicked, it's not gonna help no matter what I say. Give the dancers a few beats to adjust, but if they are oblivious, move on. It just gets embarrassing. I have seen squares where I said, oh, four boys are in the middle. 
And they looked at me and went, no. At that point, they're oblivious. I could answer back and say, well, yes, they should be, but then, then we're, we're, we're not being nice. Um, give clues, but don't call the whole call. Zoom, just say leads go back. Scoot back, boys go in or girls go in if it's that. Be careful not to directionally call the call. The quick dancers may try to do the directions as well as the call. So you, for them, you're calling it twice. Be aware of that. Be aware of miscues such as boys scoot back. The girls have something to do too. And center Zoom. There's only one way that I know of to legally do a center Zoom, and that's if the centers are in a, a box of four holding right or left hands. So you have leaders and trailers in the center. Otherwise, the centers and the outsides are all Zooming. Uh, and helping words can still, you can have the best idea for a helping word and it will still go awry. This is what happened last night. I'm calling away, the, the, the dance was alternating mainstream and plus tips. And some of the plus dancers were newer or rusty or both. And so one square was struggling with track two. So the first time I just got out quick because they had gone there was a major derailment and they squared up and I got everybody else home. Then I set them up again and I called track two. And I, I said, track two, turn towards your partner to start. But by the time I had said, had gotten those helping words out, it was too late and they had gone the wrong way. So I set it up again, a different way. And I said, now I, I said, double pass through, turn towards your partner, track two. Well, the square that was having trouble with the track two, that clicked for them. The other squares faced their partner and could no longer do a track two. So my great helper words went totally led two squares down, down the garden path into, into the swamp. So at that point, I said, whoa, I misled you. Everybody square up because this is my fault. So even the best idea for a helper word may not work. If it doesn't work, Square them up, take the blame, and go on. Use the full list of calls. Record your calling and check off the calls you used for the night. List the calls that you never called. We, I have a friends I'm coaching, and we call those the orphan calls. The orphan calls are the calls that whatever one of us, you know, and they're not the same for everybody, but... Utilize the orphan calls, list them, find out why, see if you can figure out why you don't use them. Are you comfortable enough to help the dancers? Are you not sure where they start and stop? Use the standard applications handbook to find out where the dancers should start and what, what arrangement they should have for the maximum dancer comfort. That way you can start incorporating these calls, the ones you never use, into your calling slowly so that you're more comfortable with them because it makes a better dance and more exciting and interesting for everybody if you can use all the calls that are available on the list. As I said, create sequences using the orphan calls. Make sure the sequence ends in a familiar standard formation and arrangement. Be prepared to help. Write cues into your or hints into your choreography. If you use written choreography, put in, a, in parentheses, here we should have boy, four boys in the middle. Here we should have a standard couples and facing lines so that you can then give the help without even having to make sure the floor is where you want it to be. Remember, you want the dancers dancing. Success is not 100% of the dancers dancing 100% of the time but it should be about 90% of the dancers dancing most of the time. You cannot really achieve 100%, 100% of the time and make things a little interesting. There's, there's things that are going to happen. You can try for it, but if your dancers don't dance every single call that you give for the entire night, you have not failed. As long as they stay, you're doing okay. And what can you do about the doomed square? We've seen them. 
there's a square where the weakest couples gather together, huddle and huddle, huddle there for, for, for comfort, but nobody can help anybody. Nobody is, is comfortable. Maybe they've got the slowest moving person physic who just maybe maybe there's a dancer who really knows what they want to do and they can't move fast. So they can't help anybody because they can't get there in time to reach out to the people that are going astray. So what do you do about these people? Well, you can ignore them, which I find very hard to do. You can try and find a way for them to succeed. This is where you might go back to some of the standard cliche uh, sequences for a while. L look and see who would be the weaker couples in the square. If you have the head couples really weak, start the sequences with your sides. That'll give people the chance to get into a, a, a formation where you've moved the stronger dancers into work with the weaker dancers. If all the weak dancers start to work in the middle, they never get out to the stronger dancers. Shorten the pattern. Be merciful. Let them get away. If people are in a bad square, an extra minute of patter is like a year to them. So shorten the patter and do the singing call and cross your fingers that they can, can get through that. Do not try and use all your creative ideas in one tip or one dance. Build on the more complicated themes and choreography. Building dancer success is an ongoing process. You want, it, you want to analyze, if you have a really exciting um, finish, you want to analyze where would be the pitfalls for the dancers you call for on a regular basis. What would cause them to fail? Go back and take these things step by step to build to where they can do this whole sequence. Don't just toss it out right away. Okay, that's the end of the uh, presentation. I'm a, I will cheerfully entertain questions or comments. Thank you, Betsy. A um, couple of things that came out, you, you mentioned cliche sequences, uh, simple methods to fill them out. Uh, I'm assuming you're meaning you're analyzing a floor to fill them out. Uh, you said get into the unusual and get out to the the normal or the the standard. Do that fast. Um, a question was asked about the word sussing. What that meant? I just put the rough definition, but that's basically understanding the dancer's capability on the floor. Yeah, that's more feeling, term, feeling terminology. Out the floor. Thing. Yeah. And incidentally, when Barry when Barry Clasper was assigned this as a as a, as a uh, subject. For the caller, first caller lab presentation, he wasn't sure either. Yeah, it's just a matter of terminology. It's a very common yes. term. Sus to suss out something means to try and understand what's going on. And could you explain or give a couple of examples of what you mean by cliche routines? Heads, heads square through four, swing through, spin the top. Slide through, Alaman left. Head square through four, swing through, boys run, Ferris wheel, centers pass through. And one of the things you can do is see if the dancers are used to dancing cliches. I, honest to God, years ago, and well, let me take this a step back. John Kaltenthaler would make a joke about checking out the floor, finding out what they can do by starting off the first sequence with head square through four, swing through, and then he would go <clears throat> like he had to clear his throat for a second. And he waited to see if the boys ran or if they did a spin the top. Hmm. And it's only, a, it's only a joke because I was in a square and I'm quick. I was in a square with a new dancer and the caller called head square through four swing through. And the guy who was my partner did a boy's run. He was on the other side of the square. So I couldn't grab him in time. And he ran around the other girl 
And that told me what he had learned in classes. This goes back many years, but I experienced it where this guy had never done anything after swing through except boys run. Yep. That's a cliche. They're comfortable. And if you go back to them, you can rebuild confidence. But you don't want to use them all the time. All right. Well, those are all, all the questions that came up. Let's open the floor for discussion. Um, a couple of eyes went up when you seemed to specify the difference between cueing and cluing. You expanded on that a little bit briefly. If you want to expand on that a little bit more, and then let's just open the floor up. Well, basically, cluing cluing reminds people of what they what they know. Uh, as opposed to just calling it for them. You know, when, when I first teach square through, I'm, I'm like talking like a mile a minute, right hand pull by face in, left hand pull by face in, right hand pull by face in, left hand pull by. And my rule of thumb is once they get, once they move through the square through faster than I can say all that, I shut up because they don't need all those words. What I might say at the end to clue them would be square through four. Remember, don't turn after the last hand or go forward to face your corner. I called last night, I called, I had a wave in the middle and I called the center, center four swing through. And then I was, a, was in a position to call turn through to your corner, turn through to an Alaman left. But I know turn through is not used that often in this area anymore and that and that particular ending has fallen out of favor so i said turn through step forward because what they don't do when they turn through is to finish it by stepping forward and if they step forward i say there's your corner and alaman left i gave them a clue to look for their corner i gave them a clue to step forward but i didn't turn i didn't go into turn half and blah 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 does that help so you're what you're saying is that a cue is like directionally calling. No. Yes, a cue would be directionally calling. A clue is a hint. Uh, you can give a clue when you see somebody failing to move. You can remind them of what they might be doing, but don't say the whole thing. Pass to the center. Don't forget to trade. And the, the centers usually know not to trade. Usually it's the outsides. Or, or you might say pass to the center. Outsides, don't forget. And they'll go, don't forget what? <laughs> any, anybody have any questions for Betsy? I was going to say she, she inadvertently gave a, a good example there of the of another thing she was warning about. If you um, if you give directions, uh, you got to be a little bit careful on your directions, or some people will uh, uh, like on your pass to the center. Don't forget to trade. Um, some people in the middle might uh, trade. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That, that is actually a, a fairly common thing that happens is, um, especially with new callers, if you have a group of dancers and a couple of the squares are moving a little bit slower, a little bit with hesitation, and you call something, swing through, spin the top, and you're waiting and they're doing it. So in, in the centers, cast three quarters and the ends move up. Because you've given that long break, half your floor is going to do what you said. The other half is going to catch up and when you're trying to catch up the other half of the floor the ones that have finished it properly are just going to keep doing what you tell them because they're waiting for you to dance and that's essentially what chris is saying what betsy is saying that's why your cues and your clues do have to be different you want to give them a hint tag the line yeah. cloverly girls are in the lead that's it you know they can do the rest of the cloverly if you don't have to dance their dance with words for them um, Daryl, you have your hand up. I do. Uh, just a couple of things, uh, maybe not totally within the realm of 
of what you're talking about. Oh, Betsy, nice job, by the way. Thank you. Uh, yeah, part of a, a tip, whether it's just like in a dance, a part of it is programming. And you start talking about success. How important is it? Well, where you program that success is very, very important as well. You want that tip to start out with, with successful. You want it to end successful. Any difficult stuff needs to be in the middle. So the dancers that may be a little weaker or have problems, when they go out and get down to the end of it, they succeed. They're going to walk off a success, not a failure. Uh, and one, one other part, uh, which has changed kind of up and down through the decades here. Uh, Betsy, you said that uh, uh, 90% of the floor, 100% of the time, or did you say 100% of the floor, 90% of the time? I said 100% I said of the floor, 100% of the time is not possible. 90% right. of the time, floor, most of the time is possible. Anything above that is, is success. I, I would prefer to say that 100% uh, of the floor, 90% of the time. Okay. Uh, that, that means that uh, that allows for 10% of failure, which even the newer dancers or the strugglers, if they only fail 10% of the time, they're going to feel good, especially if that 10% of the time is hidden within the center of the dance and within the center of the tip, either way. But then, like I say, that's more a programming uh, comment than it is uh, how to get them to succeed. The success is that important. Yeah, one of the, one of the that reminds me, Daryl, one of the things that I didn't put into the PowerPoint that I do apply is when I'm calling, uh, when I'm doing singing calls, I'm observing the floor. I'm, I'm lucky and experienced enough that I can look at the whole floor. I don't, if I'm sight calling, I don't have to stare at my sight square. I can look at the whole floor so I can see if there's been a problem. So at the end of a singing call, I will use whatever device I can to let them finish with their original partner. It may be as blatant as four ladies promenade, single file, swing your very own original partner. It may be as blatant as four ladies chain across, chain back to your original partner, no matter how far you have to go. Uh, but they got their original partner back and somehow that will make them feel good about it. Even if they didn't have her before I did those blatant uh, setups, to get them back to the person they started this, the singing call with. It works for me to do that. The only, the only time there's a problem with that is when they don't remember who their original partner is. <laughs> and I actually saw that one, one night right after they announced some couples, oh my gosh, it was like 50th anniversary was celebrated or whatever. I said, four ladies promenade, swing your very own original partner. And she didn't find him. And I worried. <laughs> Essentially, they got it sorted out. But, but I, I, you know, another one is four boys go in, make a right hand or a left hand star, pick up your original partner, star promenade. Back out, Alaman left, weave the ring. <laughs> Just so they can get back to their own partner. Because... The, the people who don't end up with their partner may not have been the people who made the mistake, but they will still feel like they failed. And I'm, and I'm not about to point out who goofed because nobody needs to know that. I always point out, blame me, I get paid. Oh. Well, not me personally, but blame the caller. <laughs> Actually, it's to me, it's always something I say. It's a result of something I said. Yeah. Like I, 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 I remember a certain dance in Wollongong when Betsy was calling and she says, oh, and it, it the routine just didn't work. And she says, I got that one from Mel. <laughs> I was trying to think of, um, of some more examples of, of some of the really 
uh, excellent, I thought, advice that Betsy was giving. And uh, this is about um, uh, queuing things and also the idea of if you're reading material that you wrote, uh, having some clues written down for yourself that you can refer to just in, you know, that you can refer to instantly and you know that that's the right situation. So let's have a, um, a couple's back to back, but sashayed. So the boy's on the right hand side and we're going to do a, a chase right. And that's unusual because usually it's the boy chasing the girl. So if you want to give them a clue there, first of all, you might want to give them the clue ahead of time. And this is gonna, if you have to do this, this, depending on the timing, this could be a little stop and go. You might, this might take a second to get out, but you could say something like, um, girls, you're gonna chase the boys, right? Uh, you know, chase right, something like that. And, and but another thing um, is, let's say that it was the original partners that are, that are together on this. And then you could write down on your, you could write down on your uh, card, you could write, um, uh, girls chase original partner. And then you'd be able to say something like, um, uh, girls, you're going to chase the boys. Everybody chase right. You're going to get your original partner back. Um, and then they, then they know where to stop also. Um, so, but, but anyway, so that, that, that's the kind of thing she's talking about, I think. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Whatever clue you can give. I'm a, I might, I might say, it's equal opportunity time. Girls, you're chasing the boys. Chase right. But uh, they, uh, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm talking about exactly, Chris. Any more comments, questions, queries? I got Bill, you've got your hand up, followed by Joe. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Betsy, I know the, the the idea about, you know, ending with your original partner in a, in a singing call is is highly a sequence I used to have fun with. If it was all discombobulated in the last the ending break, I would do something like have the men make a right hand star or make a left hand star. And I would say, pick up the best looking girl on the square. You had better pick the right one. That works. That's just, that's my input. I love it. <laughs> I would even go so far as to say, uh, pick up, you better pick the right one or it's gonna be a long ride home. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Okay, yeah. Um... As usual, very good presentation, Betsy. Uh, we all know, I think most of us are so, uh, have, have a few years of experience, don't we? Um, and and she, I, I think she's put it very well to give us all the confidence to, um, you know, call a dance and we do make mistakes. Anybody that goes out there thinking they're gonna be called perfectly and blah, 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 uh, they're setting themselves up for their own doom, um, but it takes it takes a, a world of uh, experience to be able to be that casual about it. Uh, and you know, I, I I hope I'm in the same category as you, Betsy, in terms of I feel comfortable. If I make a mistake, eh, so what? There's ways out of it. Make sure you have a backup uh, that's really uh, good that's gonna work, that's unique, that'll get the people laughing again and forget about that uh, you, screwed, <laughs> you screwed up possibly. Um, things, uh, things that are directional. I like to pick a couple of calls for the night that are done from a different position. Like Chris was saying, put the boys on the right side for a chase right. But you know, and don't, don't be apologetic if you feel like you have to give them a little bit of help. If you call it often enough, by the end of the night, you know what? They can do that call, and they'll probably do it the rest of their life, and they're going to be happy. Now, they don't, you know, they aren't going to remember that it was you necessarily. Um, but uh, you know, it's the kind of a thing that you you, um, you you want to help them. You want to give them a good time. Uh, I wouldn't do too many calls that way, but Chase Wright is one of them. Um, but one of the things that I I did want to mention is. 
for everybody to realize like um who was it in the very beginning i'm looking at my screen uh guido you you called an all eight circulate to a right and left through from waves right okay part of the problem is cognitively is dancers have a focus either forward or sideways if you have parallel waves and you keep calling split circulate scoop back um walk and dodge their focus is forward and back forward and back then if you in your wave all of a sudden you call a recycle your focus has to go sideways and many dancers you know they're they're already programmed they're going forward and back and many of them will do a, a split recycle which is at the challenge level which is quite nice and you can comment if people do that uh, you can praise them for for dancing challenge stuff already but it's better if we don't do that if we know where's the focus and let's let's be careful about that that adds to the dancers success uh, you know if you want to do these things uh, and have the dancer successful don't do a bunch of forward and backward things and then all of a sudden a wheel and deal which is sidewards it's horizontal um, so other than that um, I I really like that presentation super thank you I, you just jogged my memory uh, now if, now if I can remember it long enough to to spit it out will be even better ah um uh, talking uh, talking about um doing something that is like a challenge call one of the common things i see especially with newer dancers or weaker dancers is on a, we've kind of programmed them and trained them to use alternating hands most of the time because most of our calls use all you know use of right hand good flow is right hand left hand right hand left hand not to use the same hand uh together too often but then there are calls that violate that rule and scoot back is one of them slip the clutch is another uh he uses the same thing in succession same hand twice or thrice in succession and so the common error that i see is the dancers will cross over the dancers facing in will cross over and use the other hand on the scoot back and then they come back and they're in the wrong spot or they're trying to get the wrong hand and you can help people in two ways on that one is to say you might find it more comfortable to use the same hand use the right hand twice or three times or i'll say thrice just for the just for the unusual word or Boy, you guys are doing something I think is a challenge call because you used the, the the left hand instead of the right hand for the scoop back. I was hoping you use the right hand. But it, it's a way of correcting the error for the future, uh, but making making a joke about it that doesn't that doesn't demean them. It says you you guys are doing challenge already. Find a lot of time with scoot back when you have a lot of crossovers because we do that dancers looking in step straight ahead yeah and once they get into that habit and and i like i like to work with the center dancers first actually uh because they get that concept of stepping straight ahead it'll be a right hand then with the couple opposite you step straight ahead then you get a quarter uh, a quarter box so you've got the centers doing it those kinds of things so they get used to that straight ahead and then you just have the dancer facing out or the other dancer fold into the empty position or flip over however you want to teach that but it gets them into that habit of stepping straight ahead there's all sorts of ways of cueing it instead of scoot back boys left turn girls flip right you know whatever it is you're going to say um when you cue it you can just say straight in and that's yeah. the hint to break that habit of step straight ahead, use the other hand, because sometimes that doesn't work all the time. And if you just say use the other hand, uh, a lot of the time you could be talking to one square that's having problems and another square says, oh, she wanted something, she's doing something different. And they quickly adjust their position. Exactly. So as Betsy says, be really careful with the difference between a cue and a clue, but also the timing of when you give them. It's absolutely essential. Daryl, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, just quickly, uh, Betsy did mention the standard applications booklet by Caller Lab. 
I would highly recommend that, particularly to the uh, newer callers. That's going to tell you what the things that are the most common way most of the movements are done. Now, that's not to say that it's going to be 100% uh, for whatever particular area that you're calling in. But overall, she says, swing through, spin the top. Everybody knows that. It's that type of a combination. Uh, and they've got those in there, and they have the progression from the most common to some varied. So I do recommend that handbook. It's very, very important. I, uh, I just wanted to, to say, uh, for the newer callers, uh, I guess, the, the, that, uh, hand, that uh, handout, that uh, uh, sheet that she gave with all the bullet points uh, for the presentation, that's a lot of information. That is, that, that is like a huge gold mine. And, you know, she had so many things that she couldn't spend a lot of time going over each, each one very much, just some quick examples. But each one of those things is something really to think about. Um, and, uh, you might, you know, so when you take that to hand out, uh, home, you, that's, that's going to be something you can look at for quite some time and think about it carefully that there's a lot of good stuff in there, just a ton. And we were, we were talking about success. I, I, these, these things pop into my head as I hear other people talking and, you know, Joe was saying about having confidence to kind of shrug off making a mistake. You, you always feel bad that you messed up as a caller, but it is more important for you to acknowledge your mistakes out loud to the dancers than it is for you to be quiet and make them and let them think because especially newer dancers. I, I truly believe that new dancers, if for some reason a piece of the ceiling fell down at a new dancer dance, there would be a new dancer in the room and maybe more than one who would go, oh, I'm so sorry, because they would take the blame for the ceiling falling down. They are that vulnerable. So if you make a mistake, my feeling is stand up there, be an adult and say, that was my fault. Let's square up. I always do that. I always say, I, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I should not have listened to Mel Wilkerson. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, at least my name's getting out there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the way you want it, but hey. Uh, the um, standard application book. Uh, I think in last year, they separated it from one large volume into the basic mainstream and plus as a downloadable link. It downloads it as a web page or web document, which you'd have to save and convert to a PDF or print it out and scan it however you want to do it. But I put the links to the documents for the standard applications uh, into the chat. Uh, but if you are, are looking for it, you can also just do a, a Google search Caller Lab standard applications, and it'll bring you up to that. It'll also be in the program documents, because a lot of people have a lot of trouble navigating the Caller Lab knowledge base. It is still a very clunky way to navigate unless you know exactly what you're looking for and, and where to go to find it. But those generic searches were there. But Daryl mentioned the standard application documents, and he's absolutely correct. And I, I can't stress enough of what Betsy said on the one point, if you're feeling out a floor and you've got the good feel, you start small with your standard cliche routines, you know, head square through, swing through, boys run, bend the line, right and left through, flutter wheel, slide through to the corner, a man left, you can feel it out. As you expand out to what your theme is, if you want to do spin the tops with the girls starting on the outside instead of the boys starting on the outside or vice versa, you know, or heads spin the top. Get in quick to your odd position, get out quick to your standard position. If you're going to do a tag the line or you're going to do something wheel and deal with the four girls in the middle, wheel and deal, four girls in the middle, pass through. Now you've given them the clue, four girls are in the middle and the pass through, immediately get out to the standard, you know, star through and couples circulate, whatever it is you're going to do next. That way they've gone from the, this is different, but they haven't got time to think about it. 
and you put them back to normal quickly to carry on dancing with good flow. And Daryl gave uh, some excellent comments on that in some of Don Beck's presentations. He also commented on here. If you do something unusual, quick in, get them back to their comfort zone quickly and let them feel that success. Mm -hmm. You can always come back to it. And if it doesn't work by getting out quickly, you can always leave it alone and the dancers aren't gonna know that they had a problem somewhere. Any more comments, questions, queries, or points for Betsy? What about moving dancers to other squares to keep the square from failing? At a dance, I would not, at a dance, I would not move dancers unless I did something like the heads pass through and promenade to another square. But I would not specific, at classes, I reserve the right to change dancers from where they squared up to another square just to make everything work right. But I would never do it at a regular dance unless mm -hmm. I disguised it as a, a mixer sort of thing. Yeah. It, it, is, it is something when you, when you look at it, the poor dancers generally know that they're having problems. And when you start changing, especially, and I've seen this happen at, at dances, a caller will change an individual couple in a square that's like pointing out and saying, Daryl, oh, I see you're having problems dancing with, with uh, Mel as your partner. We're going to split you two up and move you to different squares. Well, just by saying, okay, can you, Bill and George, can you change with, 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 with Sam and Adrian or, or whatever? You've pointed them out. It is an absolute no. Doing something like heads, promenade, anywhere you want to. Sides, do the right and left through with a full turn and go anywhere you want to. Fine two and make four, dance a little two couple find four and make eight, and you've mixed the squares up that way, disguise promenade. The one thing that um, came up an awful lot with mixing the squares up, there's this tendency of angels to say, right, I've got two couples that can't dance very well. We're going to put them both in the side position. It is the biggest mistake that you can make. Okay, Either get them in different squares or get them in corner, because if you get a strong dancer with a weak dancer, you're going to, to separate. They're going to separate all the time. But you don't want your weak dancer with your weak dancer. So you don't want your weak couples corner to each other because they're always going to have strong pair. You know, don't mix them up. I, I've, I've always been a proponent. If people want to dance with somebody they dance to, let them get on the floor. You can manage that with your choreography. And I think, Daryl, you gave an excellent presentation on the invert and rotate module is a great way of keeping your zero boxes and zero lines, but yes, taking and I, I just have side. to say, just have to say the when we were having trouble as a couple, it was all your fault. Absolutely. Not mine. <laughs> I got Betsy and then Chris. No, actually Chris was first. Oh, okay. I got Chris then Betsy. I, I was just gonna say on the subject of you're at the class and you wanna you want to move uh, some couples away from each other, like to another square. First of all, there's no point in separating uh, uh, partners. Uh, you know, if Bob and Linda are having trouble, they're not dancing with each other any more than they're dancing with anybody else in the square. So don't worry about that. But 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 if but let's say it's Bob and Linda's the the, the problem couple in the square. Um, don't. Um, uh, rather than move them to another square, move somebody else into their square. That way you're not pointing out, uh, you know, pick, pick some, um, you know, pick some other couple and swap them. That way it doesn't look like you're, you're picking on, on those guys that you're just moving some people around and, and you might want to do it in more than one square too. That'll also sort of, uh, disguise what's going on. Hey, Bob and Linda, you know, Bob and Linda are their problems. So in their square, you say, Hey, Fred and Doris, go over here and switch with, you know, Ralph and Cindy. And over there, you guys switch too, you know, you know in some other square. Um, yeah. And and that, you know, that's, a, that's sort of a, if you really want to move some, if you really want to change the composition of the couples in the square, uh, you don't need to pick on the, uh, you, you know, you can sort of disguise it. Yeah. I, I, I missed part of what you were saying, Chris, but one of the, the key aspects, that, that's why I was saying, you know, don't put, if you got a weak couple in the square, don't split them up and put them, oh, put her as, as his corner to make, because they look different. Head square through separates them to opposite side of the square. 
your isolated site, your basic routines for learning the movements are great for doing that with dancers. That's why you want your strong couples, either heads or sides, your weak couples, because heads square through most of the time, you've separated them with the first call. They don't realize it. Uh, Betsy, you had your hand up and then back down. Yeah, and another way that I would use to separate a couple that was, you know, that were both weak, well, I would move them away from each other in the square besides head square through or whatever. If you have, if you have the heads lead right, veer left, and the boys or girls circulate, you've moved everybody away from their partner so that you've made, you've change the parameters and the and the mix of the square so that they can dance and i i chris when i was teaching you know a while ago the people i'm teaching now don't have this don't seem to have this problem but i i would once in a while separate a couple because they were fighting and i would say uh for you know no offense but for just to save your relationship, we're going to change squares here. Mm. And but that, but it would be for just the tip until they got done fighting. Because yeah. sometimes one of the people is stronger and one of the people is weaker, and the stronger one's telling the weaker one where to go, and the weaker one goes, "Stop telling me," and that's not good. Yeah. And that, on the screen, that that. Couple I'm laughing because I've heard it just like that. Yeah, it is <laughs> is your weak couple, and you know they're still together. They're dancing together. They feel like they're dancing together. They're still dancing together, and then you can do a you know, ladies trade or what did you boys circulate or boys circulate. circulate? Yeah. Now they've moved with each other and so on and so forth. They're still in that kind of relation, but they're not. When right. you want to bring them back together, you can star through. If, if you want to separate them even more. Yeah. Now they can see they're still in the same line, but you're working across the square, you know? Exactly. That's terrible choreography. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're still maintained. They can still see each other. They started together. And at the end, they're going to come back together. They feel like they're dancing with each other. But the reality is they've got nothing to do with each other. And it saves a lot of dancing. The worst thing you can do on something like that is just go, oh, OK, uh, I'm going to. Uh, oh. Oh, you guys are having problems. We're going to split you up. And that's what you, that's what your angels usually do. Oh, I'll dance with you because I'm a better dancer than he is. And I'll help you out. And the first thing that happened, you know, head square through four, they're facing each other. Yeah. And they're right back together and they got problems all over again. Don't split up couples. And it's always a good idea. If people want to dance with somebody, that's who they ask to get up on the dance floor. As a caller, it's not up to you to say, I don't want you dancing with her. You know, save, save that for grade eight, nine, and 10 when boys start asking girls out, that's my girlfriend. You can't answer, ask her to dance and take it behind the schoolyard afterwards. You know, it, it has no place in square dancing. Daryl, you got your hand up. I do. Uh... I thought I might mention, of course, we're talking about dances, we're talking about classes. Dances, I would never even enter into the idea of trying to shuffle anybody around. Absolutely. I, I just call a dance. During a class, uh, I'm going to go back to the same thing I've said a thousand times during, <laughs> during these things. There's no better way to teach new dancers than in the Sicilian circle. Uh, you dance them in squares, but if you're going to teach a movement, I don't care which one it is, if it doesn't require four couples to do, like an eight chain through or something like that, chances are it's going to be, only take two couples. Let them dance. Let them make their mistakes. Move on to the next couple. 
eventually you're going to have those weaker couples dancing with strong, experienced couples. And that helps a lot because they, you get to drill it and they're doing it with somebody different as they go around that Sicilian circle. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know this or not, uh, so I'm going to offer it right now. Uh, the Caller Lab knowledge base that Mel uh, mentioned, my booklet on teaching in the Sicilian circle is in there. And uh, the price is perfect. It's free. You go in there, you can... If you're not familiar with the Sicilian circle, you might be when you teach your next class. I still say 90% of what you call is two couple. If you're not a site resolution caller, it's the best way there is to practice resolution. Because if you can't get two couples back to where they started, you can't get four couples back to where they started. So take a look at that and think about it. Uh, one of the really nice things about Sicilian Circle for teaching is they don't have two other couples to confuse them. When they're together, they are totally together. You teach them the movement, move them on to somebody else. Teach them again. Drill, drill, drill for, uh, for teaching, right? But uh, with that said, once again, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, Daryl, I've, I've posted the link as well as the document that you're talking about from Caller Lab Knowledge Base into the chat. Um, I'm just going to expand one, one little thought before we go to Joe and then back to Betsy, unless Betsy, you wanted to comment on, on what Daryl was saying. Um, one of the aspects at the beginning of this conversation, we we're talking about things like right and left through from ocean waves and, and such and such. Because when they see other dancers in the square, they tend to want to go forward instead of working. One of the strengths of the Sicilian circle, because right up through mainstream, you've got what is 87.6% of all of your movements are two couple movements or one couple movements. Dancing in a Sicilian circle really reinforces the fact that you can work with another couple in formations of four dancers. You can see other dancers moving, but it really strengthens that and stops that wanting to go ahead. Things like square through and, and the courtesy turning and the swing through right and left throughs, all of those things really, really work well in the Sicilian circle because they've got in their mind two couples, two couples, two couples, and most of it is two couples. Um, Betsy, did you have a comment? And then we'll go to Joe. Yeah, basically, um, you know, since the Sicilian circle, you move you can move on to another couple. It's a great way to reinforce facing out things where dancers normally want to turn around. If you do, if you do something where a pass, if you have the heads pass through in a square, they feel like they're they're wrong, so they'll turn around sometimes. Or especially if you're working with new dancers, or a square through three. But if you have the if you have the couple pass through in a Sicilian circle, move on and find a new couple, then square through three, go back, find the other couple. Uh, but they can move, they, it reinforces the fact that these calls end facing away from your group of four and you, and you can make them comfortable to move on to the next. Absolutely. I've got uh, Joe and then I've got Chris. Um, yeah, um, along with the Sicilian circle, two other benefits are is you don't need a whole square to start a dancing right away. Uh, you know, many times you have uh, people that arrive on time, which is kind of nice. Uh, and then there's two couples that show up and they got to sit while the rest of the people dance. Well, as long as you got two couples, you're dancing. The other thing that I like about it is you get to dance uh, with everybody. You know, you, you get in a square, you know, you only got seven other people, six other people that you haven't maybe met before or you don't normally dance with. So, so you're in a circle, man, pass through, dance with this couple, pass through, dance with that couple, blah, blah, blah. Um, simple things like lead to the right. You know, how many times have you? You know, not that we use it a whole lot in a situation where they aren't leading to the right and facing another couple, but you can do it. It's just in a circle, lead to the right, 
reverse wheel around you know um, there are so many things you can do and the dancers can uh, uh benefit from from that sicilian circle i really love it now the absolutely other, one other thing before i shut up is um i don't know how many of you are are um considered new i don't think there's any new callers here are there um there may be less experienced um you know when you're talking about daryl and betsy and mel and me you know you're talking 50 60 years of of um <laughs> uh, time uh it's like a prison sentence but um <laughs> the, the important thing to remember is that <laughs> who's that oh betsy <laughs> sorry betsy <laughs> i'm I, I might explain, don't forget, Betsy started when she was a kid. Your parole has I been revoked, Joe. as an adult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, regardless, most of clubs as the home caller, and you have the hardest job of all as far as I'm concerned. Uh, whenever I did a tour or when I was on the road calling for somebody else's club, it's a piece of cake because you you can play when you have to develop your own dancers and help them to learn the other positions and the different nuances of calls that's a tough job uh you know it's it's uh but but that's the hard work all the clubs i call for as a home club club caller i would program my teach nights my dance nights so that hopefully they were always progressing uh, learning something a little bit new, playing with something a little bit old. And don't forget some of these old calls that we have. There are some calls out there that are just fantastic to use. Um, but whatever you're doing, especially if you're a newer caller, is to look at, like Betsy said, look at that list of calls you're calling for the night. You owe your dancers all the calls on the list that they are supposed to know. You need to call those calls at least once a night. Uh, back when I first started calling, Dixie Stalo away was a tough call. Why? Because callers, were, they didn't know what to do with it. You got them in a left-hand wave. What do you do? Uh, we didn't use cross runs. We didn't, you know, uh, it was a tough situation. My, my take on it is, if you're a newer caller or a less experienced caller, is uh, work, that, work that call, and like Bessie says, work it to normalize it into a normal situation and if you only have two or three ways to present that make sure you call that at every dance you call that way when someone like me or or daryl or mel or whoever travels when we come into your club at least they know how to get into that first formation so we can play with it um you're not doing it for us you're doing it for the dancers they gotta have fun no matter who's calling uh, you know, I don't want to come Abs in and absolutely up your dancers. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's my take. again again putting a little emphasis. A lot of people are scared of a Sicilian circle because it doesn't feel like square dance. They, their their comfort zone is having that square. And I've actually seen um, clubs where you've got four couples dancing and you've got three and a half couples sitting down because they don't want to make that or put that up. Once you have two couples, you can start calling. When you get a third couple, pick a direction. They're, they're in a line. You can either leave them standing out. You say, okay, right and left through, pass through. And if you're facing out, do a partner trade and somebody will come to you. And you can build and build and build. Uh, in Daryl, I believe it's in your document, not Cal's document, but it goes right on the very first page or the second page, um, you talk about that wayward couple that comes in partway through the dance just to pick a direction and wait because somebody will come to you very quickly i love the sicilian circle uh, when i was teaching classes and when i'm going to start teaching classes again once they've done your basic big circle movements alaman left right and left grand weave the ring those kinds of things i start every class with a sicilian circle the first 20 minutes no singing call just a sicilian circle that allows them to review. It allows me to review any movement that I want with them. It allows the dancers to interact. I don't worry about getting them back with their partner. I just get them moving, interacting with everybody and review, review, review what they've done. So it's in their head. They're in that sociability 
community and dance ability of what they already know and their comfort zone. And you've already set the parameter of collective community and sociability by using that Sicilian circle. And that is really, if you can do that, that's what's going to achieve success with your square dance, getting them to understand that that collective mass of sociable dancing is what it's about, not who can do the best here or who can say I have plus in front of my name or I dance A2. What does that mean? Well, it means absolutely nothing. And it means a lot less than I'm new, but I'm really having fun. I'm going to bring my friends. That's what we're after. Uh, I had I Chris have, State. I have, I, I, have sorry, so, I have A2. It means I, it means I, ha I can um, screw up with more calls. Yeah. Did, <laughs> true enough. Uh, uh, Chris, oh, Chris, you've moved on my screen. Uh, I had Chris Stacy next. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say something that it was, uh, it was probably covered at the beginning of, of, of Betsy's uh, presentation, but it was so long ago that I, I, I'm, I forgot. But um, the, when, you, when you're coming in and doing a dance, especially if it's uh, people you don't know, the, you know, we're talking about success for the dancers. And what you got to do is you got you to set the tone. So the first tip, you really want to make sure that that's a tip that, that, that where everybody is succeeding because you got to get them to trust you, right? They don't know you or maybe, you know, or maybe they don't know you well. And, you know, you got to convince them that they can dance and that they can dance to you. Um, so, I mean, just focusing on making the first tip because you can turn the, uh, you can turn the difficulty level up, you know, a little more the next tip and, and do that. But, but you know, if, if you kill them right out of the gate, they're just going to think, oh God, we can't dance to this guy. We're screwed. That's the, that's going to be their night. That's what they, yeah. that's, that's going to be their whole night that, but you know, but if you, but, but if it's, uh, but if they get, you know, hopefully all of everything in your first tip. You know, then when you start uh, cranking the difficulty up a little bit later, they're going to think, oh, well, you know, we were dancing fine to him before. Oh, this is a little harder. I don't know. Maybe he's being a little tricky or something. But but uh, but but it's a completely psychologically different thing, you know, going from uh, we, we know we can dance and know maybe now it's a little harder to we, you know, basically right out of the gate going, we're screwed. <laughs> you yeah, know, absolutely. Don Don had a presentation. And, and he did a lot of, um, he did a paper also on how to analyze the floor or checking the floor. And in it, he talks about all the things that can affect such as, you know, what phase of the moon it is, or did, when was the last time the janitor waxed the floor, all those other things that you can't control. But the big thing that you can control is what you are going to call and you're going to give the dancer success for the acoustics and everything else. And Daryl in a presentation summed it up very, very brilliantly and Betsy uh, edified that today. Your first routine is fixed modules. Everything is modules generally, but your fixed routine to start to feel that floor is modules. And it starts simple. It doesn't matter if you're at your, your club dance. It doesn't matter if it, you're, you're at an open dance and it doesn't matter if you're doing a guest tip. Your starting routine is a series of fixed short modules to get the dancers used to you, to get the dancers used to your calling style, your tempo, your speed, your delivery, and you know they work, they're nice and simple. And from there, you can build to see that level. And I wanna stress something um, that was said very eloquently and probably a lot more than I'm going to say it. When you are doing a guest tip, so I, I come and Joe Ubelacher is uh, you know, in town, I'm gonna come visit. He's got this big dance and he asked me to do a guest tip and Joe's just got up there to the floor and he's called Wapiti Splash the Ding Dong from a left-handed inverted hourglass diamond type arrangement. And I get, oh, wow, they're dancing really good. And I get up there and I say, okay, I'm going to do exactly what Joe's doing because I know they can do it. And the dancers will fall flat. Even at a festival, even at there's this tendency for newer callers or journeyman callers or arrogant callers that have a lot of experience to get up there and do their best showmanship choreo, not, not showman, their best show off, impress other callers with how good they are at calling. And 90% of the time it will fall flat because that's not what the dancers want. You have to build that relationship of trust with the dancers first. And as Daryl said, everything is modules, not in this presentation, everything is modules, start with your modules and build 
from the small. That way they get used to you. They can develop with you because every tip is a story into itself. Uh, Betsy, you had a comment and Daryl, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, okay. I, uh, and I actually now have two. Um, one, the one I thought of is, you know, Daryl was talking about programming and planning in your dances. If, if I'm doing a singing call and I choose not to do the same figure four times, the most difficult figure will be done in the last partner change because I can say, swing your original partner. And if, even if they mess it up a little, they're close enough to find them. Whereas if I do it the first partner change, even though I think they should be well acquainted with their corner, they won't necessarily find their corner. But if I do it the last partner change and they're coming back to their original partner, it, the more difficult figure will succeed even though they mess up a little bit. Hmm. And about the fancy choreography, the comment I keep saying is it's not fancy if they can't do it. That's good. That's good. I, I also want to add on to that. I, I saw this at a dance recently. There's a misunderstanding that, and I think you alluded to this, Betsy, because it has a lower program level, it's easier. Yeah. Head square through four, touch a quarter, scoot back is a lot easier than, um, because now we're into mainstream, than uh, sides half sachet forward and back lead to the right circle to a line and you've got your boys in the middle but that's basic okay don't let the name of a level because a lame name of a level is not an indication of the ability to dance from abstracts or the ability to dance from a different position etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, there's a couple of very excellent presentations you can go back on watch of how to judge degree of difficulty and it has nothing to do with program level. It has to do with what you're saying, how you're saying it, and what kind of choreographic material you're going to be using. Daryl, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick things. We, we bounce around so much in these that when I think of it, I put my hand up, and then by the time you get around, well, it's, it's almost- That's why I write uh, it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, it isn't that I've forgotten it. It might not be as appropriate right now. One of them was that first tip, yes. The last tip, yes. Anything difficult in the middle, yes. That's called programming. Now that's programming for a tip, it's programming for a whole dance. And that's one of the most important parts of what we do. Uh, and you have to have control of that. If you're not doing a good job of programming, it's not going to work for you. Have you ever had one of those dances where, where everything just seemed to go right? And then a couple of weeks later, you do the same dance and for some reason it doesn't go quite the same. I'm talking about uh, the music that you use, the singing calls you pick out. Maybe you didn't control the choreography as well in that other dance. Learn how to program the difficulty level of your material that you're going to have. Now, that, that thing aside, the other was that guest tip. Then the only two things that you can prove to a dancer, if you're up there for a single tip, they can dance to you, you can call to them. You're not going to walk away a star no matter what you call. But if you can prove that they can dance to your calling and you can call to their dancing, you're going to be a winner. But it's awfully easy to mess that up. Mm -hmm. So very careful. Don't, don't try to impress them with things that uh, well, you might stumble on a bit or they might not be able to do. Keep it simple. Let them win and you'll win. Dancers pay with their smile and their feet. And if you can see both at the end of the dance, you're doing okay. If you don't, <laughs> you've had it. Roz wants to talk. Roz, you've, you've come Hello, out of the Phantom of the Opera shadow. 
Oh, sorry, it's seven o'clock in the morning when you started because I'm in Western Australia, so I didn't want to wake Mark. So I was a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, just when you were talking about Sicilian circles, I've never actually tried calling that. I've tried writing choreography, so I've played with it a bit. But at our club, we've only got one set, one and a half. If we've got two, we're lucky. So it to me, it would only really work if you've got a, more dancers. So what's your comment on that? Well, my, my initial comment on that would be you've got, you generally have a full square at your club. And sometimes yes. you, you have to fill in and call from the floor. And I appreciate that. And that's fine. As soon as you got that fifth couple, you've got a Sicilian circle. You just spread it out a little bit and have them pick a direction. Anything more than six couples, you've got a Sicilian circle. Six couples or more, you can make a circle wherever you have that. But as I said, if you've even got three couples there, there's nothing wrong with saying, right, I have one couple facing and one couple looking at them. Facing couples pass through, couple facing, just train them. If you're facing out, do a partner trade or something like that. You can do all sorts of two couple dancing and that's all a Sicilian circle is, is two couple dancing, move to the next. Daryl, you're waving frantically. <laughs> in, yes. In the booklet that's available at the Color Lab Knowledge Base, towards the end of it, I said, here's how to call to two couples, to three couples, to four couples, to five couples, to six couples. And the hard one is three couples, but it's not all that hard. Uh, and there are examples in there how to do it. I would suggest you take a look at it. I, I'm not perfect, but uh, I have used everything in there for many, many years. So I, I know it's mine, but I recommend it anyway. Okay. Yeah. Now I've, I've, I've actually put that link and the, uh, a copy of, of just the, the short paper, which is I think the, the six page version uh, in the chat. You can, it, there's the link to the Color Lab knowledge base on the Sicilian circle and, and um, Daryl's handout or Daryl's document is there as well. So there's a lot of really good information there. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, the other thing I looked at was contra or rectangles. So I was playing around yeah. with that, but okay, I'll give it yeah. a try. Thank you. Roz, re yeah. rectangles. You can work rectangles a lot like uh, two couple dancing. Mm. Yeah. You, you just have the and it you know, I I set up double head couples. You know, That's so I have I two sets well. of head couples and one set of side couples. Yeah. Well, if you don't want to move them away from their partner, if you have the heads lead right, which will take some some um, persuasion because the the people coming into the center feel like they have to do something weird and all they have to do is face. But then you've got two sets of facing couples and it's kind of like a contra line, but you can work swing through and boys run and bend the line and Ferris wheel and whatever, and then bring them back. Yeah. So and it's another good way to work at it. Yeah, the rectangle with two couples, you'll also find that a good, well, not a good, most of your standard singing calls will work. Most of your standard patter zero, swing through boys, run Ferris wheel, works, spin chain through, and circulate twice, works. Uh, it just takes a little bit of, of judging. If you're going to do a pass through from lines, wheel and deal, just have the center couple do a trade and the others wheel and deal behind them. All, all of those things work you know, your triple pass through lead couple step ahead and trade while the other second couple go left, third couple go right, make lines of six. Minor adjustments like that from the lines, touch a quarter, all eight circulate, however many times boys run, all of that works exactly the same with the rectangle with very, very minor adjustments. It just takes a little bit of playing with it. Uh, you know, another little thing, a little, a little secret here is that if you have a uh, a, a even number of dancers, you know, everybody has a partner, uh, but, um, but, you know, some odd number of couples or whatever, and, you, and you're going to mess around with any of these different things. Um, even if you, even if you don't know what you're doing um, uh, in, in terms of the choreographic management or whatever you want to call it, 
it, you're laughing just joke. Getting, it, yeah, just getting everybody up to dance. They really appreciate the fact that you're getting everybody up to dance. And, and they're just as tickled by the fact that calls that they know work from strange, uh, you know, strange to them, you know, lines of three, things like that. Um, that, that you can easily just, uh, you know, make up any choreography you want and screw around. They, they just think uh, most dancers just find that fun and they, A, and, 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 they're, and they're tickled by it. Oh, look, we can do these calls from here. Oh, this is so cool. And also they, they really appreciate the fact that you're getting everybody up to dance. So even at yeah. the end of the day, if you can't resolve it or something, you know, a, a lot of the time you can, but, but don't be afraid. To mess around with this because even if you even if you can't get them back to where they started and you just have to go i don't know everybody into the middle and thank everybody for dancing and woohoo you know that kind of an ending um they're still going to think that's fun so i mean this is not don't be afraid to don't be afraid to play don't don't get it in your head oh they're not gonna like it because it isn't right because it isn't the way we always do it in a square yeah. don't forget that idea they're going to have fun i i, I want to stress two things on that the Sicilian circle has no pretense in it, which is why it is such a powerful teaching tool. It's two couple dancing, it's in a circle, you're moving to the next, there's no pretense, there's no concept of who's right, who's wrong. And even if you do mess up, you move to the next couple, the dancers can fix it quickly. You can see where the errors are because they're gonna jump out of you. That is contrary to a rectangle. A rectangle, the dancers have an expectation of you sorting out. So your choreography becomes a little more limited, but all of your two couple choreography, you can do in the, those boxes. Head square through four, you've got three two couple boxes. Make your, but dancers will get tired of rectangles fairly quickly if that's all you do. And the big caution I want to put down is, uh, I see a lot of new callers come up and they're trying to understand what is this six couple square and they're looking up hexagons and they're looking at how to dance six couples in a rectangle and they're doing hexagons. There is a big difference between hexagons and rectangles and everybody here knows that. But if you are in the position of mentoring a new caller and you talk about dancing a Sicilian circle or dancing a rectangle, make sure they understand the difference of what it is because they will go to choreography for hexagons. It does not work the same. So just be very careful with that. Uh, John, you had your hand up. Yeah, I had a, um, a, a, a local cycling club had a social night and they got me up to do some square dancing. And um, we, we started in a circle, just join hands circle to the left and then I got them into a square, but I had five couples. So I just told the fifth couple to stand behind one of the others. And then I got the sides to take your partner over and stand in front of the, the couple on your left. And I worked up and down the floor. Yeah. And I said, just stand there until somebody comes to you to do the next move. And they had a ball. We danced for a whole hour with five couples. We had no trouble at all. And at the at the end of it, the end of your line, you, did you give them some kind of indication if you're facing out, you know, California twirl or partner yeah. trade or yeah, and that, and that's that, really that's the same the principle back. of of what Roz and Betsy were talking about earlier, working that in a contra line type setup where you've yeah. got an odd couple, you just have that odd, and it's the same concept that uh, you'll see people like Chris Fear or uh, Brian Hotchkeys or them, they'll do with their progressive squares when they do it. If you get to the end and you're facing a wall, do a partner trade. It's exactly the same concept. And you, what you're doing is you're working that long line up and down or across. And um, I can't remember his name, but he's been calling for a long time. Once you have your patterns down, everything works across the grid. And if you're looking at your grid, your grid can be a square, one, two, three, four places, or it can be an entire floor of 20 the principle is the same. You're working up and down the grid or across the grid. And you can have a lot of fun with it that way. And yes, Daryl, I was talking about you. <laughs> I, yes, Daryl. I'm going to say thank you very much for putting up with me. I do need to uh, leave you now.
Betsy, nice job. Thanks, Mel. Thank you, Daryl. Daryl, before you go, Daryl, you still there? I'm I sorry, am. I missed. I'm sorry I missed your session and I'm going to miss it this week because I was on the aeroplane to Perth. So it's a little bit hard to do the session. The the party's dead without you, Raj. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that don't know, Daryl on Tuesdays runs a training sessions, open training sessions for new callers. So if you're interested in that and you are a new caller or you know a new caller, and we're talking new callers, basic fundamentals, I believe that's on his Tuesday night. So it'd be our Monday nights uh, or Tuesdays or Mondays, whatever it is. Uh, just send him a private message and he will get back to you on that. I've only just started it. So I've only had yeah. one session. They're yes, very Ross. worthwhile. Yes, Ross, we missed you last week. <laughs> <laughs> Was it quiet? <laughs> you can't be taking those, Stephen. You're not exactly a new caller. I've got 40 years dabbling with calling, and it, if you squish it all into compress it, it's less than a year. So, yes, I'm a new caller. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. It's, it's actually one of the reasons why I made the comment, because we see this an awful lot. We get some callers, and uh, I use Stephen as an example. Stephen very clearly articulates his capabilities as a caller and you say, I'm a new caller. He puts a, how long have you been calling? 40 years. And people go, oh yeah, okay. He's making a joke. Um, you know, if, if we say, how many new callers do we have here in the crowd? Just put your hand up and chances are Betsy will put her hand up and Joe will put his hand up and Jeff will put his hand up and so on and so forth. It's a joke. But there are a lot of new callers that have just started. They've got less than a year's experience. There's a lot of callers that have been calling for a year, but they're very experienced because they've been calling four or five nights a week. They've had to learn. They learned everything else when they started calling. We've got a couple of callers that have been calling for five years, but they call five nights a week, but they're still considered new callers. And we've got callers that have been calling, like Steve says, for 40 years. But if you actually take his calling time and compress it down, it's about a year. So New is a term that you have to be honest to yourself. If you're a new or a journeyman caller, new means I'm still learning the basic fundamental foundations of calling. What is a module? What is this? How do I resolve a square? How do I move dancers around? What are the little nuances? Journeyman is you have those basic foundations and you're building on them. You're comfortable getting up and calling an entire dance by yourself. You can program it. You can deal with it, you can present it well, but you still got things that you want to improve. And then the master callers, those are the ones that say, I've got information to pass on, but I'm still learning. And there's still stuff. And then you get the callers that say, I've been calling for 60 years and I don't make mistakes anymore. And I've got so much information to get on. That class of caller is what we call idiots. <laughs> okay, they're the ones you want to avoid because they're not trying, they're there to impress other callers and themselves, not for the dancers. I get in a lot of trouble when I say that, but that's my opinion and I'm gonna to stick to it because a caller that is going to be calling for themselves is going to run out of dancers very shortly. Hey, Roz, you got Bob, your hand up. Speaking of- got Roz, Hang on, Chris. Chris, oh. I got Roz got her hand up and then I'll come oh. to you. Oh. Well, when you say, how long have you been calling? I mean, my first, two years, if you want to count it, if you count the hours, it was 24 hours each year. So really I'd called for a day the first year, for a day the second year. <laughs> so when you go by years, it really doesn't add up. <laughs> yeah. Chris. Oh, I was just going to say uh, uh, for, uh, for any uh, new callers that are watching this, but, um, uh, but also for uh, everybody else uh, on the subject of continuing education, um, I just would uh, plug that um, uh, Don Beck is uh, at this moment uh, getting ready to start another round of uh, classes on uh, teaching his mental image system. Uh, so if that's a thing that's of any interest to you, you should shoot him an email and see if you can uh, figure out a, a class time uh, where, you, where you might be able to uh, do that. And they're very worthwhile, even if you've done it before or you understand or, or like me, you've read the book about seven times and still having trouble following it. 
uh, they're definitely worthwhile. I, unfortunately, I've been trying to, but my shift schedules are not being cooperative, but uh, take them. Any, any, any time you get a caller, we had a session today, uh, uh, Lawrence from Germany was on there talking about call analysis leading to a right and left grand. And I've always looked at that as, oh yeah, okay, get outs from different formations taking me to a right and left grand and I'd write a few modules. He, just that one little twig of a different approach got my mind spinning on, oh, I never even thought about looking at it that way. That's the power in attending these sessions, whether or not you've been calling for a long time or you're new, it's going to make you think and it's going to refresh you or start you thinking about calling. I highly recommend that any caller, if there's a caller school running, go to it. Even if you're going to sit down and audit it, if it's in your, go to it. If it's for newer callers and you're an experienced caller, go to it anyway, as a caller. You don't, you don't have anything to prove to anybody, but it's going to refresh you. It's going to get your mind going. It's going to reinvigorate you to think about square dancing, to think about square dance calling. And it's also going to remind you where you were once and where you are now. And you will see, when you see the light bulbs coming on in newer callers, that is such a wonderful thing that it's going to turn those light bulbs back on in your mind because they've sort of got dimmed with all that, you know, reverse the indexed wapiti splash that Joe calls. And you're focused on that bright light. And wait a minute, all oh, that little invert and rotate module. You know what? I can use that. I did that the other night. I was calling a dance uh, just outside of Cardiff near, near Maitland here and never called for the club before doing a couple tips. And I just thought, okay, I don't know these dancers. I don't know their capabilities. I'm doing this. And I've noticed that one couple will always start in the number three position. They will not dance anywhere else. Another guy will always start as the number four man. He will not dance anywhere else in the square. I, I squared up and I stood in that position. And he actually asked me to move because that's the only place he knows how to dance from. That's just a nuance of that club. And when I started calling, I says, you know what? We did this whole session on invert and rotate. I'm just going to do modules and use that and, and start calling. And I realized I had not done that. Just take it back to that session. I had not done that for so long. It was such a refreshing thing. It was such a refreshing thing to get behind the mic and start calling again too. But it was that, that kind of a, a thing that is so old, so basic, so fundamental that the light had dimmed compared to all the other lights that are shining around on choreographic management. That's the power of taking these things. That's the power of mentoring new students, watching those lights, because your lights will get much, much brighter. Uh, Steven, you have to get okay, going, no. do you? Yep. Thanks. Thanks, you Betsy. You great. enjoy dinner. Joe, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Um, just just kind of a, a thing for, um, especially newer callers or less experienced callers, you know, um, I know many times uh, newer callers or, or less experienced callers are intimidated by uh, us older folks. And the thing is, um, we, we have our own lack of confidence, I guess you might call it. Um, I know when I, when I dream, by the way, and I dream square dance stuff, all I can dream is four ladies chain over and back, right and left grand. I can't think of any great choreography when I'm dreaming. I'm on my way to call for a club, and all I can think of on the way, four ladies chain over and back, right? I think to myself, what am I going to call for this dance? Well, that's where our programming comes in. So many people think sight calling is the be all and end all. And what many callers use it for is it's a crutch. They don't, they think they don't have the program. I can just call. I see the dancers. I, can, I got the list. I'll just call this call and that call and this call. And the next day, someone that didn't attend that dance, they'll say to someone who was there and say, well, how was the dance last night? And they'll say, it was, it was okay. It was good. Uh, what did the caller do? Well, he just called calls. You know, uh, there was nothing, no hook, nothing special about it. Um, but, but the idea of intimidation, I, in, in these clinics, in fact, it was one that uh, Mel had here, 
uh, about a month ago and Brian Hotchkiss was on and he mentioned the um, oh it's kind of like Victor Borg's phonetic spelling uh, uh, speech thing you know where you know he said um, uh, uh, I saw the girl you know punctuation marks and Brian said he used um, letters and of course a lot of times you know you have head star through DPT people are like what you double pass through and Brian brought up this idea of doing this alphabetical stuff well I did it at a dance last week and I was a little worried about it because I thought it depends on the group as to how you're going to do this because the killer at the end and I had a I had to stop the square and go to the uh, singing call was when we had you know for promenade it's P you know so I had to promenade halfway around down the middle RLT right and left through sure um, HLC head ladies chain you know chain them back and you did these alphabet things and then he had he said then you have the four ladies promenade in the middle which is four ladies P in the middle well, they broke down laughing so I, I I lost control I had to go to the singing call you know so one visit to this particular site made my dance for that night because uh, you know the people <laughs> at the end of the night they're still laughing about the ladies peeing in the middle now like I say you got to use a little discretion there as to the group you use it with but this group well, was for you Joe it's, it's good to group. try new things <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it, they were a very friendly group they were getting yeah. along so well together and they had made several references that made me think I think I could do this one but what yeah, one of the um, things that I saw saw happen this is very very early um, and I was calling in Germany it wasn't me doing it but it was the issue of language and translation and they were doing along the same lines RLT well I'll write this down in the abbreviations because it's done in English to explain the language thing so you had ST star through SQT square through and it was given to a caller and he said R ampersand LT asterisk T <laughs> and what because when it was all it was done on typewriters you know the star was the asterisk the ampersand was the and 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 he was just doing what he was told just call it the way it's written r ampersand lt asterisk t and nobody knew <laughs> he didn't know what it meant either because he knew what the words were but it, it had no context and meaning so it's as you say little mistakes like that can lead to some really really interesting discussions and some good laughs as long as you don't take it too far guido you had your hand up about that seminar of lawrence he's teaching that for 25 years now um you need to analyze the calls to lead to a right left grand or element left and at first I didn't understand it when I was a young caller because well it obvious it it obviously was too difficult for me at the time. And um the what, what I've learned is when you call a unusual call or unusual formation or whatever it is, when you have a theme call. And you call it as, as the last call of the sequence leading into a right and left grand or an element left, the success rate is much higher yeah. for the dancers because they always can fish for the partner or the corner for an element left or right and left grand. Yeah. But if you have the call in the beginning and need to follow it up with some awkward choreography, for them, awkward choreography. Um, you might have problems to get the square through to until the uh, resolution. Yeah. Well, so, what, what I found really interesting with that is he would take a right and left grand and it'd be coming off a um, three quarter tag the line right and left grand. So he'd take the right and left grand 
reverse engineer it to the three quarter tag the line and stop there and say, right, how do I set up a three quarter tag? Get that set up and then go back head square through start and what's the easiest way to get to that three so you reverse engineer back to your starting fazar and then you start at the beginning and work to that fazar and see where you find a zero box or sorry a, a corner box a partner line or a corner line so you're you're reverse engineering from both sides yeah. or you're engineering and reverse engineering simultaneously and it opens up an entire world because as soon as you recognize one of those recognizable formations, now you've got to get out from that recognizable formation to a right and left grand using a specific movement. And it's a great concept. Yeah. Um, for about 15, yeah, a little bit more than that, I started to analyze calls uh, to go to an element left or to a right and left grand or to a prominent. Not each call can go to, an, uh, to a right and left grand, but sometimes um, so I have all those things uh, leading me into a Dixie Grand, leading me into a right left Grand, element left, a promenade, a wrong way promenade, a wrong way Grand, uh, all this stuff, and getting to the position to call the, the get out after this call uh, develops a whole bunch of interesting choreography. Mm -hmm. Especially, as he said, when you have a knowledge of equivalence that can lead you into those things. One of the biggest, it, it's a very, very strong platform to work from, but it's also one of the, the biggest mistakes that experienced callers make for newer callers. And, and it, it can very quickly lead into feeding with a fire hose because you can say, right, how do you set up a corner line now? You can do it from a corner line. Here's a double pass through to right and left ground. Here's a half tag to right and left ground. Here's a three quarter tag to right and left ground. Here's this from this corner line position. All you gotta do is set up a corner line. And suddenly what you've done is you've just given a bunch of memory modules rather than understanding the process of what's doing. I, as with any system, I recommend that you pick one. If you wanna do three quarter tag to right and left ground, then you set that up. You develop three or four ways to get there. You use it for a while then go to the next one and add a new one. Don't try and do uh, a tip. Everything's going to resolve to a right and left grand. And, 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 and you do it that way and you use five different get outs because you have not done yourself a service or your dancers. And for me personally, mm -hmm. I find that if every sequence ends with a right and left grand or every sequence ends at home, that you don't have the Alamand left, you don't have at least a one quarter or a half promenade, I find that very boring. I find that very tiring because there's no reward for the dancer. Save that when you get to A2 or challenge because I don't call those, I don't dance those and I really don't want to dance that kind of a dance. <laughs> no, what, 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 I, what I did was uh, I took Lawrence's advice mm -hmm. to say, can I go from which calls can I, call in, can I go into a right and left grand? But then I took it a step further. Can I take this call to a promenade? Can I take this call to a mm -hmm. wrong way promenade? Can I take it to an element left or a wrong way grand? So it's not the uh, the focus on the right and left grand, but the focus on the get out itself. Um, and there's a lot of calls where you cannot do a right and left grand. There's a lot of calls where you cannot promenade from or element left because they just don't lead into it. Yeah. And um, when the Tag the Line family was completed in the mainstream program, um, I thought, can I get um, a quarter tag to home? No. Not really, because I have a, a quarter tag formation. Um, but I can use it and say, I have a quarter tag and slide through to home. Uh, so what do I need to have to have a comfortable quarter tag, the line, plus a slide through and good body flow? What must I have? And then you need to set it up. This yeah. is not 
this is not an easy task for for a beginner caller. No. And I think that that was why the focus. I know Lorenz expands that concept for uh, further, but they're each individual sessions. Um, but probably why it was focused specifically on right and left grand and paired back today. But as I say, uh, Mark, I believe you've already posted that up on Facebook. So if you want to go and look at it, it should also be, I think, on the OC Callers website, that session from this morning. Uh, yes, it is. Along yeah. with so the if, you, if, you, if you want to go and have a look at it, that material uh, is there. And it, it, it's a very interesting session because even if you don't follow it or understand it all from start to finish, it's going to set your mind going with different ideas. And that's what it's all about. And, uh, Jeff, you're very quiet this morning. I'm always quiet. <laughs> How's things down in Adelaide? Cold. No, oh, it's beautiful here. You're in the wrong part of the country. Uh, no, it, it's going all right. Um, yeah, all right. One one question. Um, I know that Betsy said that. Oh, uh, when he went, she went to a club and went to call. They don't do turn throughs. Well, if it's advertised as a mainstream club, any club that advertises should be calling mainstream. So they shouldn't have any. I know I went to a club in Los Angeles and I called a spin chain through. They, they said, no, we don't do that. And yet it's classified as a mainstream club. And I just can't understand that because, you know, if we have a mainstream club, they do mainstream. Not probably not from all positions, but uh, they do the yeah. lot. And, uh, it's it's not I an uncommon. It yeah. It's not an uncommon thing. Uh, I was down in New England and I was asked to do a plus for a plus club, and they dance full plus, which is what, which they dance the full plus program from one position but it's full plus program, but they don't dance box to that. They don't do Alamandars. They don't do, um, I think it was about four or five movements on the list that they don't dance in that club. Do Paso isn't done, wrong way Dars aren't done, but they're a full plus club. And it's, it's not unusual. Uh, and it's one of the prime reasons why uh, Betsy was saying, use your standard modules, your fixed cliche modules that build progressively on your first tip. So you've got about four or five, it'll give you an idea of what their capabilities are. And then when you introduce, as you build up and you start doing your isolated site and your site calling and you call, I don't know, a left-handed spin the top, you're gonna know very quickly if they can do it or not. And you'll know where, whether to adapt. It allows you to feel that floor out, do what they can, see what they can and what they, more importantly, what they cannot or do not. And the other side of that is talk to the club caller beforehand and say, and ask, you know, what, what level do you dance? Oh, we dance full plus. Okay. Do they do do pass? So do they do a wrong way thar? Ask those questions. Don't just accept it. Betsy, you got your hand up. Yeah. I wanted to kind of explain to Jeff what it is that I see happening. This particular club that I was calling for last night, does not have a club caller so what it tells me um about the calling they would not refuse to do a turn through they're just not comfortable with it because the other callers haven't used it a lot my goal uh when i go out there is if i find something that they're not comfortable with i want to use it more than once to expand their level their level of knowledge about it and to make them more comfortable with it but other callers if they find dancers don't succeed at it they drop it right away rather than trying to stretch the dancer's knowledge gently there's a there's one caller who uh, trying to figure out he, he's too quick to jump in with a workshop. If, if dancers don't succeed at something, he stops in workshops. Yeah. Other callers will, will drop the call entirely. I try and strike a balance. And if, if I find they're not doing turn through a lot, then I'll add it in. Um, not so I'm doing a, a lesson or a workshop, but so that they get more than one time doing it with success. And that 
Uh, I've never run into a, cl a club where the dancer said, we don't do that call here. Uh, but I've run into a <laughs> lot of clubs where they're not comfortable doing something and they yeah. don't succeed the first time I call it. Yeah. You, you made a comment there about tape clubs and there's, there's a lot of challenge tape clubs, you know, C4 tape clubs. There's even some A2 tape clubs or, or, or records. And it, it's one of the things they, they go to at that program that most of them are experienced dancers at basic mainstream plus advanced and so on. It's not always a guarantee. Um, and I, I periodically visit a club down here and another one, uh, I'd go every two or three months and just do a dance for them. But they learned on tapes. They did not have a caller. They did have a dancer that had a lot of recorded material and was, was not a teacher, was not a caller, but tried his best to walk everybody through what was going on, but from the tapes. And that was the only experience, the only setup. So if you had something like Dixie style to an ocean wave, boys cross run or boys cross fold. The only experience they got was from what was in the presentation. And as we all know, the choreography in recorded music is often quite limited or in patter is quite expanded to the point where for new dancers, it's just impossible. So it, it, it is a definite caution to have, as Betsy calls them, a lot of cliche modules that have the basic templates that you can clue through, help the dancer succeed, engage that floor. Okay. And for newer callers or for callers, experienced callers, mentoring new callers, if you give them no other advice, give them that. They'll develop all the rest of their systems, but give them the ability to judge a floor start small, build big, and feel what a floor is. Because if they can gauge a floor, they can adapt their calling because that those skills will develop in time. But that, but that's why I said, look for the calls that you don't use. Because yeah. if several callers who call for a group don't use the same calls, that group doesn't experience those calls. Oh. Therefore, they end up not being mm -hmm. able to do those calls. Yeah, one, one of the thing, it was, um, oh, uh, not Dietmar, I, I can't remember the caller's name in Germany, but he had a, an ongoing thing because we used to go to a gas house every time. And if, if he made the mistake, he had to buy everybody around, which it, oh, it's not the expensive thing. But what it was is he would have, everybody kept a list, five dancers and he wouldn't keep a list at least not in front of the dancers i'm not keeping i know damn well he did because he told me afterwards but he had the list of the whole basic and mainstream program and he said if in five dances he doesn't do a call he has to buy everybody drinks at the gas house afterwards and what it did was it, it made the dancers actually go through the list and tick off you know and they all had their little books with the list waiting for it and, and every now and then he would intentionally miss and of course, go out and buy everybody a beer at the gas house or buy a drink at the gas house afterwards. But it was just a way of reinforcing to the dancers. There's a lot of movements and reinforcing to him because he kept a list of I'm going to call all these things. So, you know, and if you it, it's just another way of getting the dancers involved in knowing what's there, what's happening, what's, you know, and dancers love nothing better than to catch a caller making a mistake. They love it. You know program an intentional mistake into your calling. If you're, if you're that good, program an intentional mistake and let the dancers catch you up on and go, oh, what was I thinking? You know, they love it. I call, for in, I call for a club in Florida in the winter and they have up next to the stage, they, they have a ship bell. And uh, if I don't get their partner or their corner right, somebody will run up and ring the bell. Ah. Well, I happen <laughs> to have one of these Model A horns, the honk things that go honk. So I carried that with me to the second, the next dance after I found out about this, and I had that there, and I called something that would really screw them up, and they all were like, "Whoa!" And I honked my horn. I said, "There you go. <laughs> you ring, you can ring my bell, but I'm going to honk my horn." So it's, you know, it was it was fun. Yeah. I don't do it all the time, but they ring the bell. <laughs> I would hope not. <laughs> Your well, bandwidth is getting really, really low there, Joe. Mistake. Oh, 
I just plugged in my my direct anyhow I'm gonna have to go make supper or have supper so uh, I I just realized that it's 11 o'clock here we've been going for two hours and at the one hour mark Betsy I did not say thank you very much again for coming in um have you sent a copy of your PowerPoint presentation no but I will uh, if, do that yeah if you could or or you know send it to me and send it to Mark or just send it to me and I'll forward it to Mark so he can post it up with the video yeah, I'll, I'll do that as soon as we're done as soon as I leave here That'd be fantastic. And I want to say thank you again. As always, you are always welcome. Uh, it's great because I, I love the way you do your presentations. They generate that discussion. And even if it digresses into different directions, it's always well worthwhile to hear and, and to lead us down those different avenues and paths under control, which is great. And you do thank such you. a wonderful job at it. Um, there, thank as, you. As, as you all know, we have um, changed our sessions to fortnightly instead of weekly. So there is no session next week. The following week, uh, we've got Eric Tangman coming in to talk about Square View. He's going to be talking about uh, using those tabs or relabeling those tabs in, in such a way that you can manage your choreography a little bit more effective. Um, I may or may not be here. Uh, Mark has graciously uh, agreed if I am not able to get online because I'll be deployed for another emergency management session on these B mites that are affecting Australia uh, for another two weeks. So if I'm not here, Mark will be sending out the link. So check Facebook on the newbie callers webpage. Uh, you may be mailing out, it may be a different link or it may be the fix, this fixed link if I can get on, but that will be on the 14th here in Australia, 13th in North America. And uh, I hope you all have a great, great rest of the day, great supper, great morning for those of you. I hope you have a good sleep if you, you're in the middle of the night. And uh, I will see you across the square. And once again, let's put our hands together and say thank you, Betsy. As always, wonderful to have you. And my definite thanks to Mark, who puts everything together and is still looking along with Dan at ways of making sure that all of these training sessions, because there's a lot of really good valuable information, is going to be available to everybody for quite a long time. Uh, Caller Lab doesn't have the storage capacity to host all these things, so people like Mark Hart and Dan Like have been doing this off of their own backs, at their own costs, at their own server things, as well as all of the rest of it. Um, so thank you very, very much for that, Mark. Uh, we're now at 100 and I don't know, well, over 200 sessions, but 100 and some of them are recorded and online. And he also hosts on the OC Caller website links to all the other sessions, including dawn sessions in the morning. So thank you for that too, Mark. Does anybody have anything else they want to discuss, have a look at? If not, we, uh, we can call it a session. Thank you, everyone. I'll have to go anyway. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. Right. You want to talk Thank about you. the right whale study, do you, John? That's what I'll be doing this afternoon, <laughs> taking photos <laughs> of whales. Well, you have a whale of a good time. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye. We'll see you later, everybody. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Mel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.